um, to fully understand the reasons of the influence of the American culture in Italy, it is necessary a short historical introduction. The influence of the American culture in Italy dates back to the World War II, post-war period, the landing of the Allied troops in Sicily in 1943 corresponded with the arrival of the American visual and oral culture. On the night of July the 9th, 1943, an Allied armada of uh, 2,600 ships launched one of the largest combined operations of World War II, the invasion of Sicily. Over the next 38 days, half a million Allied soldiers landed to Sicily that became the first piece of the Axis homeland to fall to Allied forces during World War II. More important, it served as both a base for the invasion of Italy and as a training ground for many of the officers who, 11 months later, landed on the beaches of Normandy. On July the 25th, 1943, realizing that a fascist Italy could now escape defeat only through complete domination by Germany, the Italian King Victor Emmanuel saved Mussolini, the Italian dictator. The Allies broadcast the Italian surrender in the evening of September the 8th, and the chief of the staff of the Italian army ordered two soldiers to end any hostilities leaving them with no clear orders on what to do, which is quite typical of my country. <laughs> <laughs> the Germans quickly capitalized on this and systematically disarmed all Italian ground forces. Italians who refused to surrender their, their, weapons, their weapons were rapidly executed. On October 13th of the same year, Italy declared war on its former partner, the Germany. For the remainder of the war, Italian regular forces will assist the Allies in all major engagements. Um, this picture is, a picture is probably the most uh, famous picture of the invasion of Sicily was, uh, was took by Robert Capa, who was a very, uh, not a very important photographer. Um, and it depicts uh, 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 a farmer probably uh, giving directions to uh, an American soldier and, and just after the landing of the system. The Allies enter Rome on June 4th of the following year in 1944, but the D-Day landings in France two days later make Italy seem so much less important. The following year on April 25th, the National Liberation Committee officially proclaimed the insurgency in a radio announcement. Announcing the seizure of power by the National Liberation Committee and the death sentence for all fascist leaders, including Mussolini, who was shot three days later. The liberation put an end to 20 years of fascist dictatorship and five years of war. It symbolically represents the beginning of the historical journey which led to the referendum of June 2nd, 1946, when Italians opted for an end to the monarchy and the creation of the Italian Republic. The American influence to Italy lasted for at least a few more years, uh, until 1952, as Italy, uh, as many other European countries, was integrated in the Marshall Plan an initiative to provide economic support to Western European countries to help them rebuild their economy after the end of the war. Why is American cultural influence so connected to World War II? During the fascism that lasted 20 years, there was an almost total ban of US-related goods, artifacts, <coughs> music, and art. This is a, a pro fascist propaganda of, uh, of the 30s, of the end of the 30s and, uh, and during the war. The US and its culture of capitalism and liberty, the so-called American model, were considered as an enemy for the Italian fascist population. 
And that's why there was no contact between American culture and Italy during the, the years of fascism. Um, until World War II, the receipt of the uh, American social model was very fragmentary, incomplete, and often refused. The, fascinate, the fascination for the American mass culture arose from a real interest for a phenomenon that initially represented the freedom after the war and the fascism. The US soldiers brought to Italy and to Europe freedom and essential goods, but together with them, they brought also pop culture, vinyls, and guitars. Um, the vinyl records brought by soldiers made American music popular among Italian population. And after the war, precipitated a massive import of American music. The diffusion of the music encouraged many boys to form rock bands. But the language was an issue, of course. English wasn't popular, though. In Europe at the time, French was still the language of culture, science, and business. Songs began to be translated in Italian, and sometimes the text was even replaced with a new one in a manner not very different from what happened in sacred music a few centuries before. The outbreak happened in the first years of the 60s when rock and roll exploded in Italy. I just quoted four uh, very popular American songs and their translation in, in Italian, or at least how they were uh, published in, in Italian in, well, Stand By Me uh, was probably the, one of the very first cover of American Songs uh, in 1962. And uh, this singer, Adriano Celentano, who uh, was one of the most popular ones, uh, will be often depicted with uh, Italian guitars on, on the cover of his uh, recordings, we will see another couple of images of him holding uh, guitars. He wasn't a, well, a, a guitarist or a, a very good guitarist, but he used to play the guitar during his shows. Um, the, the lack of good quality instruments uh, encouraged numerous small factors. The increasing sell of electric guitars had a very important reflection on the Italian manufacturing. Um, 1957 is the year when a massive production of guitars started in Italy. A mix between imitation of the American models more in fashion, so basically Fender and Gibson, and pure innovation in terms of shapes and materials. This production lasted no more than 15 years, and then Italian models were completely replaced by American brands. The Italian economic miracle, called also uh, in Italian as the boom economic or the economic boom, the economic growth who took place between 1950 and 1963, allowed musicians to buy more expensive and desirable foreign instruments were foreign is American instruments. Italian made electric guitars became out of fashion and were quickly forgotten. In 1863, Paolo Soprani opened the first industrial, let's say, industrial accordion <coughs> production in Recanati in the center of Italy. You can, uh, you can see Recanati is here. Uh, this is the Marche region. Just to give you, uh, give you an idea of the geography, we have Venice, Rome, and Naples, just to locate uh, the Marche region. Um, three small cities rapidly become the most important, became the most important Italian center for accordions. Recanati, uh, Loreto, and uh, And they're all three very close to each other. And this will, um, this will explain a few things that we'll see afterwards. In a few years after 1957, 
Uh, many brands appeared on the market. I will not talk about all those brands. I will, um, I will just give you an overview of the most important ones. But we have in this area, excepting the last two ones, Mazzetti and Lanzino, they were located in, in another part of the Italy. All those brands were located in this very small area of Italy. I thought Goya was Swedish. Goya was Swedish, but uh, the zero cent, the zero set in Italian, was producing instruments for a Goya box. Most of them were produced by zero set in, in Italy. Um, the guitar substituted in the collective imagination the accordion that represented a world that was changing and that young people wanted to leave behind them. The guitar becomes one of the symbols of the new economic welfare and social freedom together with the Vespa and the Fiat 500. Um, in 1960, was one of the most important and famous Italian company, Eco. His owner, Olivier Pigini, had a broad experience in the accordion's field. All his family was in the business. He understands at the end of the 50s that the accordion's market is declining while the guitar market is growing. And uh, Olivier Pigini and Eco will find a perfect way to conquer the market. They combine the expertise in accordion's making with innovative <coughs> design. In a few years, many of the companies working in this area, following the Echo's example, convert their production to guitars. The history of Echo starts with another company called GMA, uh, founded in 1956. Uh, the production was uh, in the, in the ex-Yugoslavia, but the quality was probably not very satisfying for uh, Olivier Piccini, after a few tries decided to move all the production to Castelfidardo. Uh, I couldn't find any other information concerning the GMA, um, but uh, in 1959, uh, Olivier Piccini took over the Ankles Accordion Company to transform it in a, a guitar company. And the following year, in 1960, Echo was born. Um, you can see here, uh, we, we, we have seen another, in, I have to go back a little bit. Uh, this is interesting because the Emerald was a very uh, small accordion company. And I like to show this accordion and this guitar. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't have any better picture. Uh, because the, the same brand name on both, this is very rare. Um, I don't know any other examples of guitars and accordions bearing the, the, same, uh, the same brand. And it also shows uh, the celluloid on the top of the guitar, the same kind of celluloid that was used on uh, accordions. And uh, uh, talking about the influence of the American market and American brands, of course, you can see that the Echo Master uh, produced uh, for the first time in 1960 was clearly inspired by the Fender Jazz Master, with the main difference that uh, of the use of the celluloid uh, for the top and uh, the knob here are probably for some uh, effect that was integrated into the, into the instrument itself. Um, in 1961, Echo distributes guitar in all Europe, attracting the attention of the brothers Loduca. Their society, the Loduca Brothers, was active in the US since the 50s, selling and distributing musical instruments, as, as you all know. We had a network of 600 shops and needed guitars less expensive than uh, those ones built in the United States. Japanese guitars already covered the lowest market sector. Any instrument made in Europe was easily distributed. Hastrum, Honor, and Framus were already distributed at that time. Uh, the average market sector was the most interesting for ECO. And ECO had to compete with companies such as Dan Electro, Silverton, and Case. 
but the ace in the hole was the aesthetic of their instrument. The, collect the collaboration with the Luca Bros meant doubling the production in less than a year, moving the factory from Castelfidardo to Recanati that are just 10 miles far away, um, hiring and training dozens of workers. Um, many of them, however, decided not to move from, uh, to Recanati, and uh, uh, a year after, in 1962, many new small factories will start producing the art. Um, this is uh, a model called uh, 700, uh, with uh, this shape that is called in English, I think, uh, the power of bias. Um, yeah. And it was probably still uh, a memory of uh, the first uh, electric guitar that was played uh, with the guitarist sitting in a more classical position. Um, this picture is from 1962. Uh, is a is a uh, a fair uh, trade fair in, in Milan, um, and Eco presented uh, a plexiglass 700s model uh, that was a quite avant-garde model for that time, and appeared on the market. Uh, well, the only other example I know is the Fender Stratocaster Blue Side, uh, and my sources here. Uh, <laughs> dated five minutes ago at the site uh, to 1957, while my other source was a bit later. Um, there's always this, uh, this issue when an instrument, which is very particular, appears after another one. Um, and I was I wasn't sure that the, this guitar was intended as a copy of the site, but if this this uh, if uh, this this time difference of three or four years, probably this was intended as as a copy. But by the way, the seven hundred the seven hundred was produced for um, for four years, um, and during the four years. There were small improvements uh, concerning the design of the guitar, um, especially concerning uh, the bridge. Uh, almost all echo guitars had um, all the components made at the echo uh, factory, uh, even the pickups. Uh, we don't have almost any information concerning how the caps were uh, produced in the Acre Factory. We don't have any documentation. Um, again, uh, between uh, 1965 and 68, Acre reaches the top of his production. Most of the guitars are now solid body instruments uh, based on American models. The celluloid guitars are discontinued. Um, well, of course, this is another solid body. Um, but it is interesting talking uh, just a little bit about the, the celluloid. Why celluloid was used so much in the first echo instruments and uh, from uh, uh, even from other uh, companies at the very beginning of the production? It's simple because they were making accordions and they had they had storages full of celluloids. And they didn't, they, they didn't want us to throw it, and they reused it until uh, they were off of some lines. It, it's a very si uh, simple explanation. Um, and uh, you can see the difference uh, just a few years later. This is a copy of a, a Fender Stratocaster. Um, and we have a catalog that is in English. I don't know if it was for the American market or for the European market, but it is interesting because just uh, 10 years or 15 years before, many of the catalogs were still in French. Oh. Um, 
some other models. Uh, some models are, are, well, are inspired to Gibson instruments, and some other instruments that are completely uh, crazy. Um, there was uh, some kind of fascination um, to rockets and space, of course, and this is visible in many, many, many instruments. And uh, uh, I will show you at, at the very end something really crazy. But uh, um, all the production can be divided in, in, in two paths. Instruments that were inspired for the war copy of American models and instruments that were completely, um, completely new designed. And uh, it's interesting the fact that, as Matthew uh, said before, all those shapes were made to sell the instruments. Uh, they can look uh, quite strange to us today because the production today is quite, um, I would say, boring and quite standardized. But during the 60s, the design in Italy, in Europe, and in the States was absolutely amazing. If we imagine we, we create a link with the design for uh, in cars design, in kitchen design, appliances, and everything, we see that there's a, a, a freshness that is reflected in guitars too. Have you ever seen, I've got lots of old 60s AKL catalog. I've never seen the crazy stuff imported into the States. Have you ever seen any of the any I, images I, of that stuff came over here? I don't know exactly. Well, I. I know, well, I just know just a part of the models that were imported to the United States. I don't think that all the models were imported to the United States. Um, I don't know. I uh, just want one. <laughs> <laughs> they were probably custom made for specific yeah, yeah. bands, you know. Like, a good band, yeah. yeah. Some, some of the uh, some of uh, of those guitars were made for specific bands in Italy, because uh, well, the history is uh, has many turning points, and as uh, as you said before, that country musicians wanted to have customized instruments. What the same thing in Italy, they wanted to have customized electric guitars because they were. The band was new on, on the market, and they wanted to look new. And uh, it was a way to advertise their, well, their image on the market, too. I, I, sorry, you're talking about the, did they import the strange things. I know that in the late 80s in Los Angeles, there were a couple of stores that got a hold of a bunch of new old stock of EKOs. And they were selling them, and for I mean, like a, a fairly long period, about a year and a half. And most of these were unusual shapes. A lot of them were kind of a modified flying V shape, and and yeah, stuff uh, with the Rogue, which was named after a band called yeah. the Rogue. So yeah, yeah. And I think all that stuff that was in LA came from the Laduca Brothers Warehouse in Milwaukee. Right. Is that okay? Because that place was like a giant, you know, elephant burial ground. Of EKO stuff. <laughs> yeah. What was, what was it? It was a couple. There was a couple of stores on Sunset that were like doing all guitars R Us. Yeah. Guitars R Us, and there was one other. And they, yeah, they're exactly right. There, yeah. Yeah. Well, when I was talking about rockets. Yeah. So no, these. That's what I was. Yeah, I was talking about. In fact, those. In fact, those are exactly like the ones yeah. that they were doing. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, in, in the same period, at the end of the 60s, the second uh, part of the 60s, Echo was producing the large with internal efforts for Vox. Uh, Vox will end uh, its guitar production in Asia in 1970, and Echo will end uh, the production for Vox in uh, 1969. And uh, in 1967, Olivier Pugini will die, and the production will slowly decrease in the following years. Echo will concentrate more on keyboards and organs, instruments in fashion because of the progressive rock. Uh, the concurrence with Asia for cheap instruments was impossible. 
and American models copies were not enough to keep the company uh, alive. But uh, ECO reopened uh, a few years ago and now is, uh, is, is, is again on the market and they're uh, producing, well, I would say standard instruments and copies of the instruments of the 60s, some re-edition. Um, let's jump to another company that has a strong relationship to ECO, uh, Cruciannelli. Um, the relationship to ECO determines uh, Cruciannelli's whole guitar history. During the glitter celluloid era of the, of the first half decade, the two companies are in tough competition. Um, for every Echo model comes out a matching Cruciannelli instrument. <laughs> From 1965 on, on, both companies increasingly specializes in its own field. Echo focuses on acoustics and solid bodies, Cruciannelli on semi-acoustics, and both cooperate with Vox. Technical contributions of ECHO and Cruciannelli now together also on certain box and even ECHO models. Uh, Olivier Pugini was planning a merger of both companies' guitar operations, but his sudden death in 1967 didn't allow the projects uh, come to reality. But, um, again, this guitar is a Cruciannelli. This is the Echo Master. Just the headstock is uh, is different, but I mean, it is exactly the same instrument. And uh, uh, well, completely strange instruments. And uh, uh, we have the prices. This was for the American market. You can see the price with vibrato from eight one hundred eighty nine to two hundred. And, uh, and the other model from $184 to $194. And again, the Cruciannelli, um, some of the production was uh, clearly, well, inspired is not the right <laughs> term. Uh, <laughs> uh, let's say inspired by <laughs> American models, while well, we have copies of Gibsons, and uh, uh, this, well, they, they claimed in their advertisement, this is a 335 style, I mean, they were claiming that we're making, uh, making copies of Gibsons uh, instruments. Did, did any of your guitars become so similar to the Americans that they became lawsuit guitars with the American companies soon? The Italian company. I don't have any proof to that. Um, I think those kind of died out before that whole thing, the lawsuit thing started. Well, I think that those instruments were not, I mean, the copies were not imported to the United States. And I will do a parallel. Um, when uh, records were published in the United States when a hit was published in the United States or in England, it took like four or five months to come to even your friends or to other companies. So during those four or five months, producers in Italy translated the text, published another version in Italy, and if this version was commercially interesting, they asked for the rights to the uh, American uh, let's say publisher. And if not, if the, if the hit or the song was not uh, uh, interesting from the commercial point of view, they didn't even ask the, the rights because the, 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 the vinyl was not on the market for well, I think that the Italian market was so small that Gibson and Fender were not interested in pursuing any legal uh, act. Um, 
And also because uh, Echo, for example, was covering a large uh, section of the American market. So I, I don't know what kind of deal was there, but um, I, I don't have well, notice of any uh, legal. These don't have Gibson shaped headstocks, and that was the only thing the lawsuit was based on was for the Japan, Japan model of the Gibson, ba Gibson shaped headstock. Yeah, so I can even get, get put on the car for a few times. The what? Takamini. Um, yeah, that was a Martin shape. Another company, uh, this is a quite uh, unusual company. Really? I will, well, yeah, I mean, I will tell you why. Um, Luigi Giulietti was born in Recanati and immigrated to Chicago in 1914 after a long training, a long training uh, in the accordions world. In, 1950, in 1923, establishes in New York the Giulietti Accordion Company. And at his death in 1950, the company name changed to Giulietti and Son Accordion Company. The son Julio becoming the director. <clears throat> With the after-war economic growth, Giulio Giulietti decided to open a production site in Italy. In 1945, he founded with six partners the Society Vera Sette, which means it's zero seven. There were seven partners, and this is the maximum of fantasy they had to make the company. <laughs> Nowadays, Vera Sette is one of the worldwide leading accordion companies. Giulietti moved all the production from a company that was called Serranelli to that company, Verosette. And when the guitar market started growing, Verosette also started producing guitars sold with the brand G. Uh, no, I don't have a slide. Well, with the brand JG, Julio Giulietti, or Juliet. There are a few guitars that have a JG on, on the head song. Electric guitars were also sold to Goya, a brand of the Hirschman Musical Instrument Company in New York that distributed many European brands such as Levine and Hextrom. In 1966, the Avnet Inc. acquires the brand Guild, and the following year, the brand Goya. This fact can explain the similarity of many Goya and Guild semi acoustic models. Well, this is, uh, well, this, this image is absolutely very famous. It's Jimi Hendrix playing uh, Range Master Goya. But the Range Master Goya was produced by uh, Verosette in Italy. And, uh, um, let me, okay, this is, well, this is a, a Stratocaster copy from Verosette. And this is a more typical instrument from uh, the zero set that with, with a very typical headstock, and you can see the brand name here, the zero set. It's, it's interesting because even if this guitar is, well, it's not exactly a copy of a Stratocaster, if we, sorry, if we hide this, this part of the guitar, the body, it's basically a Stratocaster body. I mean, the influence of the Stratocaster body model was so strong then that uh, we can find some kind of trace of his influence in almost, uh, well, in many of the solid body guitars. And then, uh, if you look to this instrument and to those instruments, it's the same one, but these are Goya instruments for the uh, for the American market, is basically it's exactly the same instrument with a different brain, uh, a brand name on on the headstock. And uh, we jump again to another unusual maker. This is very unusual. Um, Antonio Pioli, whose nickname was Van Bre. Um Well, I will tell you, well, many of you know uh, the name Van Dre, the Van Dre guitars. 
Um, the nickname means was was given to him to his dad, and in in dialect in one of the many dialects um, means um, basically walk backwards, someone that doesn't follow the directions and it's uh, it's pretty independent. That, that was his nickname when he was a kid, and he kept his nickname and he named his company, Van Dre. Um, he was born before the war and he passed away just, well, a few years ago. And that's him uh, playing, well, playing, uh, trying to play a double bass, a customized double bass he, he made. This picture is probably uh, 2000 or 2001, I'm not sure. He has been an uncommon maker. He was the only that didn't have any family connection to the musical instruments industry. The father was probably a violin maker, and Vandre didn't grow up in the Castel Fidorgo atmosphere. He produced almost 70,000 instruments in a small round plant factory uh, between 1957 and 1968. This is one of the very rare images of his factory and uh, the design of the factory was innovative just now for uh, architect our architectural reasons but it was also trying to support a different um, approach to the work uh, of a shared space also well, without barriers uh, typical of the end of the 60s um, he was a free thinker and his activity was pushed by artistical and creative reasons rather than commercial ones. Building guitars was, was just an aspect of his poetic urgency. He was also architect and sculptor and was politically engaged with a direct connection to his, par to his past partisan activity during the war. And, uh, his instruments reflect his unusual vision of the life. Um, this instrument is uh, quite well known model. This is, uh, uh, well, he named uh, this guitar after Brigitte Bardot. And uh, very recently, on Guitar Aficionado, there was an article concerning uh, Joe Perry that recently uh, boat or, or receipt uh, model from one trip. Um, and you can see this is a very unusual instrument with, uh, with, this, with the, the air holes at the bottom of the instrument instead of uh, the waist. And uh, he also produced uh, a double bass with this uh, very interesting shape. And, uh, this is the singer I mentioned before, and uh, this is uh, a rock oval Van Dre model, which I, I think this is probably one of the most famous model in the US. Uh, it's very uh, easy to recognize, and it's also interesting, this, uh, this publicity, because it says, la guitarra del artista, which means the artist's guitar. So referring to Van Bray as an artist and not just as the company owner. Um, and instrumenti uh, dell'avvenire means the instruments of the future, of the incoming time. And uh, one of the characteristics of uh, Van Bray production was the use of the aluminum for the neck and the head of the instrument. They were uh, well, they were very stable. They were uh, light instruments with uh, a very deep attention to uh, design and uh, to uh, um, ergonomics. I have a question. Yeah, I have a question too. Yep. Yeah. You, you have, it says Framus on the, and, and Framus was a guitar company in Germany. Yeah, um, probably <coughs> um, this model was commercialized by Framus in Germany. Um, so is it a collaboration? Uh, 
I will not call it as collaboration, but probably uh, France was distributing one Dre instruments, ah, gotcha. and they were just advertising France one Dre to create some kind of direct connection between the distributor and, and the maker. But uh, 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 Vandre didn't produce any instrument for uh, distributors. He only, uh, at least in my knowledge, uh, he just built his own instruments without. Uh, yeah. So I, I can't read Italian. I'm really into Vandre instruments. I can't pronounce Vandre the way that you do. Uh, was the rock oval the guitar model and the rock and roll was the bass model, or did they make guitar and bass models of each of those? I, I, I don't know what the description says. Well, uh, I didn't read the description, to be <laughs> honest. The rock and roll model is a completely new one on me. I've never seen that. I think, so, I think that the rock and roll yeah. model was, I think the rock and roll model was just the bass guitar model. Um, yeah, I think that the rock album was the guitar and the rock and roll was the bass guitar just to differentiate the, the six strings guitar from the bass guitar. Um, but they're quite different. Yeah. I mean, they're not exactly an analog of each other. Or the, the rock and roll looks hollow. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, and this, the weight here and the weight of the bass guitar is two kilos and seven hundred grams, which uh, Matthew math would be in pounds. How much would you say? Uh, two point seven kilos, which is like five, five, and, a half pounds. Pounds, five and a half pounds, more or less. It's a light bass. Yeah, and the price. Uh, well, it's interesting that the bass guitar was a bit more expensive than the guitar. We have fifty thousand from here and. 67,000 liter for, for the bass guitar. Well, it's better being a guitar player than a bass player, probably. Uh, well, another instrument, uh, I just wanted to show you the, uh, the skill craftsmanship and uh, the design of the neck. This is the heel of the neck, uh, this is the headstock, and the tie piece. The tie piece is absolutely amazing, and you can see, well, uh, how biz bizarre were uh, those instruments. Uh, an information I don't have is if Vandre was producing his own pickups or not. I think so, but I'm not sure. We know that Vandre was producing every single piece of the guitars Con, uh, including the machine hats, but there are no information uh, about pickups. I think they were produced in the same factory. By the Sorry, that, 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 that there's the answer to your question. You know, that, I saw that. Yeah, there's uh, six that, string all about it. Because that's a, that's a six string uh, rock and roll. Ball, yeah. the same. It's the same. Uh, it's the same as the bass. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. Okay. So. Uh, and that's it. That's a new one on me too. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and uh, on the pickups, didn't a lot of the pickups say Divoli on them, which I know confused a lot of people about. Yeah. You know what was this guitar actually called? Because some of them didn't actually say Wandre on them. They only said Divoli on the pickups themselves. Yeah. I I think that there was a bit of confusion even at that time. Um, this company was run in probably in a quite unusual way from Van Dray. He wasn't a businessman, and that's why he, the company lasted 10 or 11 years, and then he, he never did any other guitar in his life, something completely different. And probably also the naming of the models changed a bit during the years was, I, I don't know, it's, uh, this is a very uh, poor documentation about them. By the way, a book has been published, uh, I think, three years ago, but of course it's just in Italian. I can give you the reference afterwards if you want. Um, sorry, you make that also? I have, sorry, sorry. Yeah. I have to interrupt. Could you go back to that picture? I'd like to point out that F hole, no, the, the go back to the. That one? Right. 
If you look at what's going on with the F poles, that's actually one F pole that has been spread out yeah. on two sides oh. of the instrument. Oh, yeah. it's and it's a deconstructed yeah. this is this is the F hole is drawn by Salvador Dali. Yeah. yeah okay. so if you see you can see the bottom one that's been way exaggerated up. There's the middle section of the F hole, and then the other one is kind of turned around on its and you will see an image that is quite interesting to understand better uh, this but, man. But they weren't doing drugs at all. No, not, 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 not at all. Well, 1961, this is another uh, very well-known instrument. This is the bikini model. And the bikini model was an instrument that had an integrated amplifier. Uh, wow. And well, you, you can recognize the player. Uh, this instrument was played uh, for a tour in 1961. And uh, well, apart the, the the amplifier, the integrated amplifier, we still have the aluminum uh, neck and uh, head stock. What was the jug used for? Yeah, that's us. Jug band. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, you bought it, came with the case. Some other uh, quite uh, unusual instruments. Uh, this instrument. Now, this guitar was inspired to John Lennon, and this guitar is now actually owned by Sean Lennon. Um, and well, you can see that this is a very uh, particular headstock because it doesn't have any more our band rate headstocks. This is called a mini model. It was a small uh, guitar, um, but it's it's. Probably this one is the only example of a guitar that has a body that can, in some way, recall uh, a Fender guitar. But it's the only one. It's still. It, sorry to interrupt again, but can I just say one thing about the, the top guitar on the previous slide? Yeah. Do I, you know, go back? Uh, oh, yeah, sorry. The brown one there. No, two, two more. The one you were just oh, at. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Better. The brown one there. Those were distributed through some kind of Dutch distributor. I can't remember the name, but Retrofret had one in New York City. And it has this whole molded plastic thing that the pickups are mounted into that you can see. But what you can't see there is there's a reverb spring underneath the two pickups. There's a built-in reverb spring inside of the guitar. I remember we were at Retrofret when they unscrewed it and took it off and we were all just staring at it like, Man, those Italians were like, that. <laughs> did it work? No, it did not work. No. <laughs> well, nobody is perfect. And uh, this is the, the manufacturing, um, the, fa the factory, when it was reopened uh, in 2014 after 10 years uh, of uh, Vandre. Vandre's death, this is a picture of the 60s with the, the, the double base just in, in the parking lot. And I wanted to show you this couch, because this couch was made by Vandre, and it's just to show how uh, he tried to integrate uh, uh, guitar making and uh, architecture, because he, um, he designed the factory itself, wow. uh, himself. And uh, also the furniture was designed by him and was made probably in the factory. Um, and this again is the, the singer Adrian that I mentioned before with a, uh, with a rock and roll guitar during a TV show. Now, the, the last two ones I want to talk about for very few minutes because, well, yeah, it's quite long in this village. Our two companies, there are, they, they didn't really produce uh, electric guitars, or at least they, they didn't produce any sub-body guitars. Uh, they have a different history, and they were not located in the same area. Mazzetti was located in, uh, in Modena, which is in, well, not, not, not so far from Castelfidardo. And the second one uh, was located in Milan, in the north. But both Mazzetti and the second one um, were families with a strong tradition in uh, violin and guitar making. And uh, uh, their guitars were basically 
uh, our stop uh, guitars or flat top guitars with some kind of amplification. I think that they were not really interested in making uh, electric guitars at all because of the lack of entrepreneurship or whatever, but they had to, uh, uh, to make happy their customers in some way. So they, uh, they produced a very few models. Uh, Mazzetti was active between uh, 19, uh, the beginning of the 20th century and 2010, and they mainly built plucked instruments and a few violins. Um, the instruments were often inspired to Gibson models, and all the accessories, machine hats, tailpieces, and pickups were German, uh, sometimes Italian, but not their production. They basically assembled. Uh, the, the instruments, and uh, well, you can see well a, a few instruments that they they, they produced, and uh, this is the most interesting thing they did. In 1968, uh, they made uh, a group of instruments for this band that was called in Italian Johnny Marines, Johnny and the Marines. Um, it was a typical 1968 band, uh, uh, very left-oriented, uh, uh, protesting against war and so on. By the way, I, I, find, I found a couple of songs on YouTube, and I do not suggest to... <laughs> <laughs> well, don't waste your time. <laughs> um, and this band starts using the, this Mazzetti Marins guitars, and they built a, a guitar, as you can see here, a seven-string bass guitar and a twelve strings, uh, a twelve <coughs> strings guitar here. But uh, sorry, did you say seven-string bass guitar? Yeah. And that's seven courses, or is it like, uh, I mean. This is the only image we have. I found a reference uh, coming from, um, I had a reference from a Mazzetti collaborator that told me uh, they made a seven string bass guitar, but this is the only information I have. Okay. And unfortunately it's too small to, to see uh, how the bass guitar looks like exactly. Um, but the, the interesting the fact yeah, of this small yeah. group of instruments is that there was no cable. The connection to the amplifier was guaranteed by an FM transmission system, a futuristic device that had a single precedent. The Voyager made my micro frets in 1967. Oh, right, the Yeah. And, uh, but this is, those instruments had another feature they could shoot small flares. From <laughs> <laughs> and then close face. Well, what happened to the guitar? Yeah, what happened to the guitar? Yeah, what happened to the guitar? And how many? And when they reissued it? <laughs> I, I think I don't know if uh, I don't know if the bass guitar and the twelve strings guitar are somewhere. Probably this is somewhere in, in Italy, but I, I, I don't have any information. It's been converted to a full uh, I know that um, the, the founder of this group that was very active in that area uh, died a few years ago. I don't know if it's fam his family still have uh, one of the instruments. Well, the last uh, company um, is Monzino. Monzino, well, Arian is very familiar with the uh, Monzino family because uh, was one of the oldest families involved in violin and guitar making in North Italy. Uh, they were active between uh, the middle of the 18th century and they are still active in a different way because uh, Monzino is the, uh, is the leading uh, musical instruments distributor in, in Italy and they work uh, from this country. Well, to everything basically. Um, it's the 
It's the only family in North Italy that had multiple generation activity together with uh, the Bordenini family and children. And during the 20th century, the, in the Manzino workshop divided in two main sections, stringed and plucked instruments, worked many important violin makers, among them I can put the members of the Biziak uh, family. The production of electric guitars started at the end of the 50s, uh, but just a few models were produced, mainly amplified guitars and arched up guitars. Again, this is always the same singer. Yeah. <laughs> but I told you, his picture with many of these important instruments of, of the time, this is uh, one of his recordings, and those are the only sources we have um, sometimes. I mean, it's not very uh, easy finding, uh, finding uh, pictures of those instruments being played uh, at the time. Um, to my knowledge, solid body guitars were not uh, produced. Even if there's the possibility that a few examples could have been built as a special customer uh, request. Uh, the shop would be closed in the, uh, in the 1990s, and nowadays Monzino is just a uh, musical instruments uh, distributor. <laughs> yes. First, amazing talk. That was there was so much there that was completely new to me. Uh, that was. No one is sleeping. It's great. Yeah. <laughs> I was maybe I was maybe speaking too loud. Oh. <laughs> So no, um, uh, but one one quick question yeah. on the um, on the how, and again like the it's like how do you pronounce it? It's Wandre. So it rhymes with Andre. Yeah, uh, it would be Vandre. 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 So the the the, 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 uh, the stress is on the second syllable. Vandre. Vandre. Yeah, on the last one on the final E. Okay, and I was going to ask you, because I'm curious to think, is like, I know, uh, I mean, the first time I'd ever seen, you know, those, I think it was like a lot of people, there's a picture in the Ultimate Guitar Book in 1991 that I had, uh, that, in fact, I think it had the, uh, the Rock Oval, and, uh, and I think they identified it as a Davoli. Uh, so where, yeah, where does this, where does the Davoli? Davoli. Davoli. Davoli was distributor. Was just a distributor, and uh, uh, Van Bray worked for well, had many instruments distributed by Davoli in Italy. Davoli is still uh, is still on the market, but now it's very small. It's basically just a small right. Shop. So it'd be like seeing Chicago musical instruments on something, or 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 something. Yeah, I got gotcha. you. Yeah. On that same subject, I, the first time I saw it was uh, Tysco Del Rey when he used to do those guitar No, you know, so that you're, and you're, yeah, yeah, yeah right, on that, that you're right, and that's exactly, yeah. And uh, maybe you can answer this. I don't know if uh, Van der Rey guitars were ever uh, uh, imported to America, but there, there seem to be quite a few of them over here for some reason. Uh, I'm not sure if they were, let's say, officially imported to uh, yeah, the to States. Um, I know there are more one Dre guitars on the U.S. market than any other Italian brand, probably. But I think it was because they were so particular, and they had, and, and they didn't, they don't have any visual connection to American models, and yeah. they were completely different. That's probably why they're on the American market now. Well, I was going to say, you know, I remember when vintage guitar dealers started bringing those around in the '80s. You know, when you first started seeing them kind of after Tysco Del Rey would have them in the magazine. Right. It's kind of like, hey, look at these weird Italian guitars, but nobody knew anything about them. And most of them didn't say Vondre anywhere on them. They just said Diboli on the pickups. Right. So everybody thought they were but they, but, but once you see, of course, you know, the, the tailpiece, it's like... The, yeah, W. But I don't think everybody even recognized the tailpiece as being a W, even right. though it looks, you know, it's obvious in retrospect. That, that's one of those things where I don't think a lot of the information got out until the internet started, you know, and then... We, yeah. we started learning about all yeah. this. Well, to, to be honest, I don't know why there were instruments without the Vandre brand stamped on, on, on the headstock. I, I don't know. I think 
excluding the fact that Van Bray was uh, producing instruments for Dabli and that he was selling them as Dabli instruments. I, but I don't have the answer. Also, one thing, I actually owned one of those double basses. Oh. Um, yeah, back when I, back when I was a musician, and uh, I, I, uh, for a while, I was really into uh, all the cutaway style double basses, like you know, been made by uh, Framus and Hopper, you know, people but like that. You had a BB or Bruce Barker models? No, 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 the, the, the double bass. Oh, sorry. The, the double oh, yeah, bass. yeah. Um, but mine did not have a uh, scroll like that. That has the, uh, Aaron, you can help me. What, what's like the, the, this kind of scroll with the flatted top, and what are those, those are like a, like a vial style. Uh, but I'm trying to think, who's the instrument? Flat. What's that? What do you mean flat top? Like the, the scroll, but instead of coming up to like a scroll, it kind of comes it's up. It's like a shield shape. Yeah, yeah. But, but often they're square, but like the thing is square, and, and it's associated with certain kinds of vials, and I'm blanking on it. In, in not, not particularly. I mean, Strad had us had a scroll like that. But right, but anyway, mine did, mine did not. Mine had like a regular scroll, but I <coughs> think that the neck on mine was not original. When I got it, it was in very, very, very bad shape, and it didn't have any of the original hardware on it. And uh, but it had the, the same distinctive shape and the same kind of you know uh, goofy old air holes. Of course, I used to tell everybody it got that way because I left it in the car too long. <laughs> uh, well, and, and I'll just throw in, um, you know, as if the Wondre guitar stuff wasn't weird enough, there's a website that's like a, you know, Wondre fetish site, and it has all these different things, and Wondre made these uh, upright electric bases that were solid body, and they had, I'm trying to remember if they were lion or what the headstock was shaped like, but it was like these, these animal heads, you know, and, and this aluminum neck through construction, solid body, played like an upright. I've never, I've never seen one in person, but I've seen, yeah, I've seen pictures. Yeah, I mean, that guy is just like, his ideas were. Yeah, I mean, it's worked just for 10, 11 years, and then yeah. he left completely. I mean, he cut any link with the guitar for, for, the, for the rest of his life. And did he, did he make stuff after guitars? Did he make other things? Well, he worked, well, he joined some uh, artistic groups or... You know, <laughs> he mean, joined a commune. Yeah, we uh, call it a commune. I mean, he, at the end of his life, he was an alcoholic and uh, probably... You know, he, he worked a bit uh, as a sculptor and uh, he did some, uh, let's call them performances, artistic performances in the last years. Um, and just right, right after uh, closing the company, uh, he designed uh, leather clothing for a few years. Huh. Mm -hmm. So was, was Italian architecture at that time in any way in step with his designs? Like when he made the round building? And yeah, the round know, building and the crazy, crazy furniture. The was time. that indicative of what was going on in Italy or was he just on Saturn? Well, it has a connection uh, with with some trends that are, you know, ongoing in Italy. But I think this was the first round plan factory. I would probably be the only round factory <laughs> we had in Italy. Is it still around? Is it still? Yeah, around? it's still it's still there. And you said there's a book come out on him. Yeah, I think three years ago. Uh, but it's, well, I've never seen that. I've always suggested you can. If anybody finds it, let me know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we'll all be out there each other. I will send you. I will send you. We'll know which train not to do reference. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Thank you.